Okay, so we begin the course with uh, talking about inverse trigonometric functions. And well, you have talked about this back in pre-calculus, uh, when you, which is the course where you first learn trigonometry, and then from there you define the inverse trigonometric functions as well. And while it, before doing the calculus of trigonometric of inverse trigonometric functions, uh, it's important to look at some of the aspects from uh, pre-calculus before getting this ray. I mean, of course, I could just give you the formulas, take the derivatives, and well, but now it's important to have a look at all these pieces of information. Well. Uh, let's recall some of the basic aspects from, well, either in trigonometric, in uh, intermediate algebra or um, pre-calculus about one-to-one -one functions, inverse functions. So that's the, those are the points that we need in this case to determine the existence of an inverse function, right? Uh, and well, so given a graph. Uh, how do we know, okay, question for everyone, how do we know if, uh, if the graph represents an invertible function? The vertical line test? The vertical line test, well, the vertical line test, uh, that's to determine whether a fun uh, graph is a function, right? That is, if it, cr it has to cross, the vertical line has to cross at most once, all right? If it crosses more than once, like a circle, for example, or a sideways parabola, well, then in that case, it's not a function. So, but it's close. It's something similar to determine whether the, a given function is invertible. So, yes? Um, is it the um, origin axis symmetry? The symmetry, well, it's not, it's not by symmetry, but it's something about like a line test, but it's not the vertical line test. It's something else. The other one, which one is it? Horizontal. The horizontal line test, right? So the horizontal line test, right? Well, in this case, we have a problem with the sine function, right? Because the horizontal line test well, the horizontal line, it's crossing, well, in this, if we consider the entire graph infinitely many times, right? But I mean, in our, in our picture here, it's, it's crossing one, two, three times. So, so it's not, so it's not invariable. But how come do we still define the inverse sine, the inverse cosine, or the arc sine, arc cosine, depending on the notation? Well, so in this case, what we do is to restrict the domain of the function. So we, so we highlight a portion of the graph that if we trace a horizontal line, it never crosses more than one. So that's a very clever way to, to turn pretty much every function you want into an invertible one, even a sideways parabola or even a parabola, a regular parabola actually, not a sideways, but a regular parabola, you can um, make it, you can turn it into an invertible function by restricting the domain. So, because usually the domain of the sine function is all real numbers, right? And in this case, well, we don't have any asymptotes or false or etc. Well, so in this case, if we restrict the domain to, in this case, negative pi over two, to pi over two, inclusive, well then we have an invertible function and hence we have, uh, we can define the graph of y equals sine inverse or arc sine. So you may see either, you may see both notations on, on well like pretty much everywhere, you know, my math lab, other textbooks, online resources, they use both notation okay and well so the range the range of the sine function still remains negative one to one right that doesn't change so all we do is restrict the domain not the range and well so when we want to find the domain and the range of the inverse function all we do is simply interchange those so the domain of the restricted function becomes the range or the restricted range and the range of the original, func original function becomes the domain of the inverse function. Well, uh, without doing too many details, the graph of 
arc sign sort of looks like this you know? and in this case if we label this from negative 1 to 1 and from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2 okay does that ring a bell from back in pre-calculus yeah. Okay, so that's what we're going to do for this first page. So we're going to do the same with the cosine function. Again, uh, unfortunately, that horizontal line crosses more than once, so we're in trouble here. We, don't have, we cannot define an inverse function, but using that clever trick of restricting the domain of the, of the cosine function to a portion or to a region where we will know for sure it's not going to cross more than once which is going to be actually here all right the the highlighted portion only okay uh, then in this case well Think of infinitely many horizontal lines and I claim that none of them will cross more than once. Are you guys following me here? Okay. So in this case, well, we restrict the domain, well, not from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, but from 0 to pi. And the range, again, negative 1 to 1 for the inverse cosine. Okay. That remains the same. Okay. And to find the domain and the restricted range for the inverse function, namely y equals arc sine, oh no, 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 arc cosine, or cosine inverse. And so in the graph sort of looks like, without too many details, I mean, if for it, you're not expected to memorize this graph, so that's fine. Uh, ultimately, I'm not going to ask you anything on that. Uh, so let's just interchange this so from 0 to pi for the restricted range because it's the, it's the inverse of some function that contains a, rest, a restricted domain and that's going to be still negative 1 to 1. All right. Of course, we're not going to look at the six trigonometric functions because, well, the most important ones that we're going to work with are sine, cosine, and tangent. The remaining three are not very common, so we're just okay with the first three. And, well, not surprisingly, what happens with tangent? So, it's not an invertible function at first glance, is it? So, well, what do we do? restrict the domain and well how do we restrict well because in this case we have a periodic function uh, we usually restrict it to something close to the origin in this case this portion right and well restricted domain that's gonna go okay I'm gonna make a mistake here to see if you can catch it you'll, you'll let me know what did I do wrong and the range well is the range still negative one to one no, what about the range then? Mm -hmm. Parentheses for negative 1 to 1? Well, I agree with the parentheses. And exactly, these arrows pointing down and up in imply uh, negative infinity to positive infinity, right? But I did another mistake on the restricted domain. What's that? Should be, parentheses. should be parentheses because those endpoints at negative pi over 2 and pi over and positive pi over 2 we have asymptotes and well asymptotes you know we know the story of asymptotes right so we never get to actually touch those values so parentheses round all right so parentheses restricted range for the inverse And the domain is all real numbers. All right. And the following graph, this is one that uh, it will be very, very useful to memorize. This one. Uh, so that becomes like this. That's the graph of, of the inverse tangent function. Why do we need to memorize this graph? Or at least have an idea of how it looks because 
in the following chapters when we compute what is this um, improper integrals we will look at integrals that give rise to the arctan function and for, for improper integrals well one of its types it's one in which the limits are infinity and well we will need to, to evaluate the arctangent function at infinity and well asymptotically goes to uh, pi over 2 or negative 5 over 2 depending on the direction of the limit all right so that's about it in terms of uh, of the graphing point of view for from graphing point of view for so the um, inverse trigonometric functions, where do we get them from? How do we how do we construct them actually? Because again, we need this uh, this trick to restrict the domain so we get an invertible function. But of course, okay, eval let's evaluate some inverse trigonometric functions and well, all it most of this will stem from knowing the unit circle. Or or the uh, or the triangles depending on what you prefer. So typically I use triangles, the the special triangles, the 45, 60, and 30 degree, and then just post uh, actually draw them in the corresponding quadrant. I think it for me it's easier. But if you already memorize the unit circle, you're comfortable with using the unit circle. By all means, you should get the same result. It's fine. Uh, but in this case, well, so we're going to look at arc sine of negative root of 3 over 2. Well, in other words, this, this expression right here is asking, in this case, which angle has a sine that is negative root of 3 over 2. So, any ideas on this one? Which angle is it? 5 pi over 6. 5 pi over 6 okay but one one thing to keep in mind is the domain the restricted domain of the inverse function so in this case the answer to this question has to be an angle that is in between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2 right and well it also it would also help to to know the, the the mnemonic all students take calculus have you heard of that one okay so let me write it down a s t c well what is that all students take calculus that's to denote that the first quadrant has all trigonometric functions to be positive the second quadrant only has sine and of course it's reciprocal cosecant to be positive the remaining the remaining functions are negative and the third quadrant, which has the T, only tangent and it's reciprocal, which is cotangent. And the fourth quadrant, which has the C, that for, that's to denote that only cosine and of course it's reciprocal secant are positive. The remaining are negative. So we want sine that is negative, but between negative, negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. So it has to be uh, somewhere on the fourth quadrant, right? And I think for this one is negative pi over 3. You can look it up on the unit circle or your triangles either way. All right. Arc tangent of 1. Okay, so which angle has a tangent of 1? 5 over 4. Mm -hmm. That's all it is. 5 over 4. Okay, in this case. Um... Cosine of arc, cosine of 1. Hmm, interesting, this one. Okay, to have a, let's have a look at this one more closely. So this reminds me of the following operation. So what about e to the ln of x and what about ln of e to the x? What about these two expressions right here? The first one is? X. What about the second one? X. Also X, right? In other words, E cancels LN and LN cancels E. In a similar way, we have these operations between the trigonometric uh, functions. You know, so uh, in some cases, however, not in all cases. Be careful. Uh, we can do that. In this case, that's fine because, well, that's within the range of. Of the, of the inverse cosine function, so that's one, okay? 
However, we need to be very, very careful with, uh, with letter D. Arc sine of sine of seven, five or six. Yes, this looks very tempting to do. Because why not? Arc sine is the inverse of sine. I mean, why not, right? However, there's a little issue here. Recall that the inverse sine function has a restricted domain. What's that restricted domain again? Negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. That is quadrants 1 and 4. All right. Okay, let me draw a little picture here. And let me highlight here. Let me highlight where the region where the arc sine function is defined at. So, and while 7 pi over 6, it's an angle right here, isn't it? Don't, it, it, it's an angle that is outside of the range of, of, um, <clears throat> of in this case, hmm, the shaded region, if we will. All right. So in this case, we need to define uh, seven pi over six somewhere, um, you know, somewhere in. Oh, well, actually. There is a little typo here that I just noticed. Well, okay, no, never. No, that's fine, that's fine. Okay, we need to work with this from inside out. So what is, number one, what is sine of seven pi over six in the first place? Negative one half. Negative one half. And then from there, we evaluate the arc sine function but, uh, but in this case, somewhere where the arc sine function is defined is, uh, okay, so we want an angle whose sine has a negative sign, all right? Is that quadrant one? How about quadrant four? That's where, right? And in this case, that's negative pi over, negative pi over six, all right? Other kinds of calculations involved from precalculus involving these um, combinations, yes, combinations, compositions of trigonometric functions and their inverses, tangent of an arc secant of some random quotient, some random number. Of course, if we had something like the previous example, you know, where we have like a half or square root of 3 over 2, well, those are known values from the unit circle, or we can get those from uh, from the, the related triangles, either whatever you, you do is fine, right? But when in this, in this case, 6 fifths, well, we don't know what angle is this, and well, in this case, we need to come up with an, with an exact value, not, de not decimals. So, how do we go about this one? Well, This quantity inside of the brackets, let's just call it theta. So let's see, we're evaluating tangent theta. And when we define this, we're saying that arc secant six fifths equals to theta. All right, and we're going to write an equation on the side for this arc secant of six fifths equals theta. Okay, and then from here I'm going to take arc sec on both sides, I mean sec secant on both sides, and that's going to be simply secant theta equals to 6 over 5. And in this case this is where the right triangle trigonometry will kick in here. So, well, so we're going to construct a right triangle with this information. Okay, and let's just call this acute angle theta, and let's label the sides based on the trigonometric function that we have. But now, first of all, uh, we need to be aware of what do this quotient mean. Recall Sokotoa, all right? So, secant, what's the secant function in terms of hypotenuse and all that? Hypotenuse over, adjacent. hypotenuse over adjacent, so that's hypotenuse over 
adjacent so that's a six over five right here and then we would need to use the Pythagorean theorem to to find the missing side so that's a c squared which is six squared equals a squared five squared plus b squared that's 36 equals 25 plus b squared and well 36 minus 25 that's 11 and b equals the square root of 11 all right and well that's the length of the missing side square root of 11 and with all this information we're going to go back to the original question and the original question is asking us what is tangent of the triangle given rise by this arc sig of 6 over 5. So tangent in terms of SOCA, and that opposite over adjacent square root of 11 over 5. Mm -hmm. Let's do one more, let's do letter F. Uh, cosine of arc tangent of x over 4. Well, in this case, we have a variable going on, but it's going to be pretty much the same process. I mean, just one of the numbers will be just x. Okay, so that means in this case, we have some cosine, uh, we have cosine of some theta. Whatever that theta is. Notice in these situations, we didn't even care about what the angle is because ultimately what we want is only, it, it's just the values of those trigonometric functions not in, and nothing else. So, uh, doing the same relation here. Arc 10, x over 4 equals to theta. And then from here we get that tangent theta equals x over 4. So let's construct another right triangle here. Let's label this acute angle of theta. And well, tangent in this case is opposite over, over adjacent. So this will be opposite, which is x, and adjacent, which is 4. And all we do is use the Pythagorean theorem in the same way to find the missing side. So c is, in this case, the hypotenuse. c squared equals um, a squared plus b squared again. So c squared equals x squared plus 4 squared. c will be x squared plus 16. And we can, at the same time, solve for c to get by, t by taking the square root of both sides. All right, and I'm going to label that here. We're done with getting all the information, with filling in the blank for every single side of the triangle. We may go back and evaluate the trigonometric function that we, that we were requested to write. In this case, cosine, which is adjacent over hypotenuse. That was a very typical problem in precalculus, whether you took math to 44 here or whatever you took. Is that, is that problem ringing a bell from back then? Well, this kind of problem, this last one in particular, it's very important to keep it in mind when we get to the methods of integration on chapter eight, uh, which is gonna be maybe in a couple of weeks in particular trigonometric substitution. So we are going to compute integrals that contain these forms. We're gonna set up triangles like this and then we're going to uh, turn the problem given in the, in the world of X to the world of trigonometric functions, solve the problem in the trigonometric world and then go back to the world of X. Well, you'll see. In the meantime, let's, well, now that we reviewed a little bit of the precalculus of, uh, of trigonometric functions, uh, let's see. So, <clears throat> 
let's get to the calculus the the actual the core part of the of this section you know the calculus so well so we're going to find a formula for the derivative of arc tangent of x okay so well so the fact that we well essentially this looks like y equals to arc 10 of x okay so well i mean finding the derivative of arc tangent of x well mm, you might be thinking well if the derivative of tangent is secant square can this be arc secant square well no it's not just it's a little bit more than just that in fact we're going to use the the tools that we just discussed in the previous problem to derive a formula for this one well again we're talking about mm, inverse trigonometric functions and well the fact that y equals arc tangent also implies that uh, x equals um, tangent of y you know if we solve back and forth between notation like like we were solving an equation so and well arc tan this is going to be very important by the way okay let me let me take a side let me take this on the side in particular the tangent y equals to x from this tangent y we are going to construct a new a new triangle but i mean we don't have this x looking like an actual quotient so we can see oh opposite over adjacent you know the usual however this x isn't it the same as saying x over one and now it looks like a quotient opposite over adjacent x over one and in this case again c squared equals a squared plus b squared c equals the square root of x squared plus one squared which is just one right and then we're going to use this piece of information later in the derivation of the formula right so well so how are we going to find the derivative of arc tangent from if we have no idea how to proceed from here well we don't know we don't know what the derivative of arc tan is because well that's our ultimate goal but if we use the, the inverse function in this case by setting up this mini equation here we know the information for the derivative of tangents do we yep so in this case well if you look at that equation that's going to imply um, having to differentiate implicitly remember implicit differentiation from cog one so well what's the derivative of x one what's the derivative of tangent y secant squared y but when we differentiate the y's remember we do multiply by the y dx is because we're basically doing a chain rule we're differentiating a y which is a function that depends on x so that's why we need to be specific with that notation so well from here how about we we solve for dy dx so we can start getting the formula so dy dx equals one over secant squared y all right and well so in this case how about we use trigonometric functions to i mean trigonometric identities to simplify this well secant in the denominator is the same as which function in the numerator cosine, cosine okay yes so cosine squared y but wait a minute i mean check this out so we want to find we want to find the derivative of arc 10 x but we're getting a function in terms of y right we need to get back to the original variable x we're going to use the triangle right here that we set up on the side before taking the derivative to turn this into terms of x's and y's well number one i would like to rewrite dy dx equals cosine 
cosine y quantity squared and then from here what's cosine from the triangle one over the square root, one over the square root. Mm -hmm. so dy dx equals one over the square root of x squared plus one quantity squared and we can simplify this further dy dx one squared which is one and the radical with the square cancel out you're giving us x squared plus one in the denominator and that's the end of the proof derivation of the formula to differentiate the arc tangent function all right what did we do well given the fact that we don't know anything about the derivative of uh, our tangent we reverse the operation to turn it into a tangent take advantage that we know the derivative for tangent build a triangle implicit differentiation go back to functions of x of course that's not something i'm going to ask you to do on the test and i'm not going to derive every single differentiation formula those formulas are in the definition box at the bottom of the page you know that's all that's all you guys are responsible to know not the derivation so we usually take the time to do these derivations because they're fun to do it's pretty cool to see the connections between the core concepts you learn in pre-calculus and putting them together in you know in, in the calculus setting okay I mean like just like any I mean at this point in calc 2 that means you went through calc 1 you know all the differentiation rules like the flood rule, flotion rule, chain rule, everything so all we're going to do in this section in this yes in this section is add new rules you know like the like back in calc 1 would you learn the, exp the, the differentiation of exponential function logarithmic function new functions are assigned all right so let's see uh, find the derivative for each function and simplify if possible actually yes we need to simplify all this and well just a quick comment uh, before moving on to the derivatives notice the derivation i did for that we did for arc 10 x it's only for x all right However, the formulas in the definition box, instead of having an x, uh, they all have a u, and that's because we're generalizing these rules to whenever we have composition functions, which is always the case, right? Like, it's not like we will only differentiate arc sine x, arc cos x, no. So we, we're gonna make this more composite, right? And so, Find the derivative, so that's arc tangent of 2t. So all we need to know is identify the, uh, the, the derivative formula for arc tangent. Let me see if I can have it here. Well, let me, let me write it down. 1 over 1 plus u squared du dx. Okay, so that's the formula for arc tangent. Arc tangent u prime, all right. Well, in this case, h prime, that's 4 times, right, because of the coefficient in front of the function, and that's, um, first of all, 1 over 1 plus the u squared, in this case, the u is the 2t squared. And a very common mistake, I, 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 do, I typically do this mistake when teaching the class is to forget about the differentiation of the 2t so the derivative of 2t is 2 so we're doing a mini chain rule in here all right and we are essentially done with the calculus part of the exercise the remaining part of the problem is to simplify in this case the score the coefficient with the derivative that's 8 over 1 plus 4t squared. Be careful because another very common mistake when we have 2t squared is to square only the letter t and not the coefficient. And in this case, the, the parentheses are around both the coefficient and the variable. So just keep that in mind. All right. Letter B, p of x equals 16 arc sine of x over 4. So 
Well, all we need is identify the formula to differentiate arc sine. Let me write it at the top here. So that's, um, what's this? Um, arc sine. Just so you don't flip through pages, I'm going to write it here. Arc sine u prime equals 1 minus u squared at the bottom du dx. Okay? So I'll, I'll be writing this formula just so you don't back to them. All right. Okay, so oh, arc sine. So 16, first of all, p prime of x equals 16. Uh, 1 over the square root of 1 minus the quantity u squared, but in this case the quantity u is x over 4, alright? But in this case don't forget to differentiate that x over 4. What's the derivative of x over 4? 1 fourth, fourth alright? 1 fourth. It's the same as writing 1 fourth times x, right? x over 4. Well, let's simplify this because we're done with the calculus part. Just identifying what the derivative of arc sine is. So let's divide 16 over 4. Is that a 4 in the numerator? And in the denominator, we have this complex fraction that we will have to simplify all the way. x squared over 16. So... Uh, be careful because, well, this is actually an exam question, so whenever you see this start right here, when I'm doing something, uh, well, you'll see it on the videos or sometimes I will do it on the board, uh, that means it, this is a typical exam question. And, well, what do we do in this, in this exam question? Well, this is, not a, this is not a final answer. We need to simplify the complex fractions, and there's a couple of ways to do this. Uh, number one we can we can add an invisible one in the denominator and combine the fractions by multiplying numerator and denominator of the first term by the missing factors in this case 16 16 so that's a 4 over the square root of 4 or no 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 16 minus x squared over 16. All right, but we still have a complex fraction because we have a big fraction with the denominator, the denominator in this case, having a fraction inside of it. So we need to compute this well. Notice in this case, we have the square root of a quotient. We can use the quotient rule of radicals to rewrite this by the way to go about this is 4 over the square root of the numerator over the square root of the denominator and that's a 4 over 16 or square root of 16 minus x squared over 4 but be careful when writing fractions like this whenever I see fractions like this notice I wrote parentheses around and this is just to denote which which way the fraction is because if we if I don't put parentheses like this it may not be clear for you whether the fraction is 4 over the radical divided by 4 or 4 over the radical over 4 so it's kind of ambiguous here so that's why it's important to have this parentheses just so so you don't uh, get confused about it and well one more step well so we are dividing by a fraction whenever we do that we multiply by the reciprocal so that is four four times four over the radical 16 minus x squared 16 over square root of 16 minus x squared that's final answer for this one this is a simplified uh, a simplified answer because this one right here that we had before finding the LCDs, if you type that on my MATLAB, it may not accept that as a final answer. So just be just beware of that. Okay. Mm.